Tom Brokaw, I think, is the epitome of the perfect news statesman, I call him. I like him a lot. Tom Brokaw, too straight. In addition to uh, being a terrific broadcaster, he could also do downhill skiing and represent us at the Olympics. Why he has that billboard out, if it ain't Brokaw, don't fix it. You ever see that on the West Side Highway? If it ain't Brokaw, don't fix it. He, he, no, he's Jerry. better than that. You know, Tom Brokaw knows what he's doing. But Judy and Jerry? Jeez. You all know Tom Brokaw, but you may be wondering right now, who in God's name are those two yo-yos up there with him? Well, I'm Judy Licht, and you may remember me. I anchored and reported the news at several stations here in New York over the last 18 years. And I'm Jerry Delafamina, and the only reason I'm here is because our marriage counselor said that doing this show together would save our marriage. Well, that's about as good a reason to go into broadcasting as I've heard. Um, I should say, though, that Jerry is a pretty well-known advertising slicky. He's an author, a restaurateur, a businessman, father, husband, lover. You get the picture. Unlike my husband, our first guest seems, well, perfect. In fact, in some circles, he's uh, referred to as Tom Terrific. And not only is he the perfect anchor, the perfect husband of a terrific wife, and that I can attest to, he's the perfect father of three terrific daughters. Here's the near-perfect athlete. He mountain climbs, he fly fishes, he played varsity sports in high school and college. He does everything but crawl on his belly like a reptile. Well, tonight we'd like to see the other side of Tom Brokaw. Well, wait one second. That description sounded very, very much like the description they give of a, of a man who turned out to be an axe murderer. He was a good husband, a wonderful <laughs> man. I really liked him. Uh, Tom, who is the real Tom Brokaw? Um, uh, Walter Mitty, actually. I mean, you know, it's wonderful to hear all of those things, but I, I think that one of the reasons that I'm in journalism is that I lead a very rich fantasy life about wanting to be all these things that I get to interview, you know, the people that I get to see. I can quickly identify with them, and I, you know, I think maybe one day I'll come back as a rock star with a ponytail and a tattoo and an earring on one side, and then the next day I think maybe I'll come back as a great neurosurgeon. So I do have myriad interest and the great thing about journalism is that you kind of get to indulge them. I dare say, however, after that glowing introduction, <laughs> it's fairly clear to me that you did not pull the Brokaw daughters. They would have given you a much different fix on it all, you know. No, that was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, Tom, although I've heard they, they like you now. I mean, it was just during the teenage uh, years. They, you know, they, they'd say, well, he talks the talk, but he doesn't always walk the walk, you know, and he can't dance, has no rhythm, you know, don't let him sing. Well, you know, they have get a lot of takes on me. They roll their eyes. Well, you know, here's the thing about you. I, wait, what matters to you most? We've known each other socially for a while. Um, I know how involved you are with your family. What matters to you most? I think that. I think that, uh, you know, Meredith and I have known each other for a disgustingly long time, uh, since we were 15. And I still, to this day, look at her and, you know, she, I'm in awe of her, and I have a sense of excitement about being with her uh, almost anywhere in the world at any given time. And I think that uh, that's very important to me. And then the fact that we've had these three wonderfully independent uh, daughters who cannot be put into any single mold. So that counts for a lot. And, you know, and a lot of other great things have happened in our lives. I've had professional good fortune. We've, you know, material rewards have come our way. But you strip all that away and, and the good times that we've had together as a family. And then the fact of the matter is that things that matter to me are the things that I care about in our society, what's going on around us, you know, and I've never, I've never kind of lost my, my passion about that. You just said something that I, I know that uh, I feel, and I come on, and I, I'm, I'm soft, and I'm quiet, and I'm, I, I really am not the person that, and yet I know that to get to the top, whether it's advertising or anything, you've got to be pretty tough. You really have to have a, a tougher side. I, I mean, I don't like to think of my tough side, but it must be there because I never would have gotten it. It's there. It's there. Trust me, it's there. <laughs> well, I think, I think what would surprise me a lot of people about me, two things. One is that I like to be alone a lot more than people realize. I, for all my gregariousness, I am somebody who enjoys solitary experiences, backcountry skiing or, uh, or backpacking or just going off and, uh, by myself and doing things. The second thing is that um, growing up where I did, which was in South Dakota in the kind of 
you know, the Great Plains where there was not a lot going on, uh, to look to the far horizon and see New York and, and to aspire to it, you knew that you were going to have to work very hard. And I developed a kind of momentum, I suppose, is the way to describe it. I worked very hard, and I have not stopped peddling. And I think that I've gotten to where I am because I work very hard all the time. You said that, in something I read once, you said that you were the kid in high school who always volunteered. Right. Um, I want to be front and center. Right. At what point did you know that about yourself? Were you? Well, my parents say from the earliest possible stage. And I, I must say I have a long memory, and I do remember vividly, wanting to be involved where whatever was going on in whatever town that we were living in. And I think that that's, that's part of it. But I have a also have a strong sense of right and wrong about as it affects me. You know, I think I've worked hard enough to get that. Let me get positioned to get that. Who were your heroes? My heroes when I was growing up, my biggest hero uh, is a young man who, you know, played a lot of sports with me was Jackie Robinson. I'll tell you a very quick story about that. I, I, I lived and breathed Jackie Robinson's life when he was playing for the Dodgers. I'm not quite sure how that happened out in South Dakota. You know, South Dakota, Dakota yeah. Jackie, Dodgers. Robinson. Jackie Robinson was my hero. And, I knew everything about him. I tried to affect the pigeon toed stance when I came to the plate and played second base and did all of those things. And I never met him. I got to meet a lot of people along the way. And I was fairly late in life, and I had not yet met him. And I was working in California, and Nelson Rockefeller was coming to be interviewed by me in a political show. It was a fairly big deal. He was running against Nixon. He was trying to get the 68 nomination. And this was a critical interview for him. And the Secret Service had come in and all the advanced people. And I was, I was this 28-year-old political interviewer. And the door opened, and I was steeled for Nelson Rockefeller. And I saw Jackie Robinson, and I knocked over two Secret Service agents, brushed aside Nelson Rockefeller, and was pumping the hand of Jackie Robinson. Tears practically in my eyes. Robinson was embarrassed, and then quickly I was as well. Ja that was Nelson Rockefeller's problem. People always pushed him aside. <laughs> right. He was everybody's second right. choice. So he was, I mean, he was a big hero of mine, and I thought all that he represented, you know, with a breakthrough and how he did it. And then, you know, I think all the people of my generation had Edward R. Murrow as a hero. And the big, the window on life for me was not television because we didn't get it. We lived in such remote areas. Life magazine was our window on the world, you know. And so all of those great photographers, I, they were early heroes of mine. Margaret Burke White, and Alfred Eisenstadt, and all of those people that I, you know, I came to know through Life magazine. You know, this is our first interview for mm -hmm. our first show together. I wonder, do you remember what your first interview was? I remember, I think, uh, my first television appearance, which was in Sioux City, Iowa, when I was 20 years old. And I remember that they finally let me do the noon news, which included a live commercial. And it was for, as I recall, Twinkies. And it had a toy rocket. And I was to say, supposed to say that these Twinkies will give you the same power and energy of this rocket and reach over and hit a little button and it would launch. Wait a second, I wrote that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> It had certain earmarks. And I was kind of the Joe Izuzu of Sioux City, if you really want to know the I knocked over the rock and I knocked over the set. Things were coming apart on us very quickly. And then one other time in Sioux City, everything was done very was done live. And I had to do the audio in the booth and then run down on the floor and say, the weather will be brought to you by Wells Blue Bunny ice cream just in a moment. And I, one night I thought, I've got time. I've got to go to the bathroom on the way. And they turned around and they cracked the uh, television camera lens open, and there was this microphone dangling there. There was nobody there, you know, and I was happily standing at the urinal 25 feet away. <laughs> okay. Is it, was that the lowest point for you? Was that the worst moment you had? It was uh, close. It was close. I had an unfortunate open mic incident in Omaha oh, that tell I us. cannot oh, repeat. I honestly, to this day, cannot repeat it. It was so, it, to, this, to this moment, I thought that there, there well, let me put it this way, there are there are ladies in Hastings, Nebraska, who are still lighting candles for me at the Roman Catholic <laughs> Church. It had to do with the death of a pope, and there was something that was said into an open microphone when we thought it was closed, and it was not as flip as it came out. But in heavily Roman Catholic eastern Nebraska, I thought that they were going to return to the days of the Middle Ages and, you know, get a large stake for me somewhere. He's turned out to be Uncle Don. <laughs> right, that's this right. The same kind of thing. And yet, and yet the career survived. Yeah, well, you know, those are the important, that's why you work in Omaha. If you make a mistake there and not in New York. So, you know, was the most, what was the most frightened you've ever been? The funny? Frightened. Frightened I've ever been. I think frightened is probably um, Beirut during the war, you know, because you, you never knew where the, 
the shots were going to come for an exit with kind of sniper city on the on the other hand you know getting back to the commodore hotel every night with this kind of evil and war group of characters that hung out there at the bar and you know drinking a lot and then signing they had a, we had an arrangement with the concierge there that all the booze that we drank would be listed under laundry so when we submitted it to NBC we would say well we had four thousand dollars for the laundry in that week it was a very bad time you know and so I think Beirut was probably the scariest who was the most frightening person you ever interviewed frightening person that I ever interviewed um, there was a man in um, have to, in he was called Blowtorch Bobby. Do you remember Bobby Dobeson, who was the who was the man who was elected in El Salvador when they had the big yes. deal, oh, yeah. and he was the head of the. He would only weighed about 128 pounds. He had the coldest eyes of anybody I'd ever seen in my life, and I always felt that he was the most sinister guy I'd ever seen. And he ran the Salvador death squads, and we've learned a lot more about those in recent years. And he won the election when the United States was hoping that they could get a sense of democracy down there, and. Uh, he was truly a scary guy. He was a kind of cobra-like in his intensity. And yet I also remember looking at him and thinking this frail little man has caused untold number of deaths, untold terror for so many people. But you do you ever want to throttle? I mean, you ever sit you want, there? Yeah, and, I do. Yeah, yeah, in the middle of an I interview. And feel yeah, like you, 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 you know, obviously, you often want to reach out and say, how can you say that or how do you believe that? I remember that night. The, the day that I did him, I was doing it up on the uh, on a, a rooftop of a hotel, and there was a gunship clattering off in the background because the rebels were coming down. Through and I said, you're known as Blowtorch Bobby uh, around here because of your particular methods of torturing prisoners. Well, I looked around, and all the technicians and all the other reporters were bailing out. <laughs> they were getting out of there as quickly as they could. They didn't want to be around. When Blowtorch Bobby was called that to his face, and he his eyes just went blank with me, and uh, he had four or five bodyguards off to the side. We, we want to find out more about the more serious side of Tom Broca, and also uh, the more serious side of where the news is going. We'll be right back. I like Tom Brokaw. He's a good newsman. I worry about what happens after Tom Brokaw, what the next generation of anchors will be, whether they'll be as good as Brokaw, Jennings, and Rather. We're back with our guest, Tom Brokaw, and uh, I'm Jerry Delfamina, and this is my wife, Blowtorch, Judy Lick. <laughs> and that, of course, thank you, Jerry. That, of course, was uh, uh, Panoletta, who was the media critic for The New Yorker. And uh, he also was the author of the best-selling book, Three Blind Mice, about how network television operates. And, you know, he really is concerned. I talked to him. I did that interview, Tom. And, and I wonder if you're just as worried as he is. No, I'm not. I mean, a couple of years ago, Ken's a pal of all of ours and everything, and, uh, and he, I think he's wonderful to have as a kind of monitor. But a couple of years ago, he was worried that one of the news divisions was going to go out of business. That's not going to happen either. The fact is that they're all flourishing. And there's a whole new wave of very serious journalists coming into television news at the network level. It's the most heartening thing that I have seen in the past several years. I think it has to do something with their generation. Young people who might have gone into newspapers, who've gone to the very best schools, have language skills, know how the world works, have grown up with television in a new way, and they're familiar with it. And they've come to work for us. They've gone to work at ABC and CBS. So I think... Yeah, I think that if I may be so bold as we pass the torch, they'll, they'll continue to carry it high. Yeah, I, I really believe that. But we live in a, in a world where Howard Stern and current affairs, I mean, they seem to be reigning right. supreme. What's the future for good, honest, thoughtful journalism? Uh, well, I think it, it'll be a lot more niche, Jerry. You know, there used to be only three networks. Now there are lots of them, including Channel One, which I think does a lively, vital job in the city. I welcome that. You have many more choices here in New York. Look at the morning shows now. It's not just the three networks. Now you've got everything else going on as well. The Fox show, New York One is going on. So I do believe that it'll be much more of a niche, that people will have a narrower band, I suppose, of places to turn to, and that the networks will always provide, we hope, you know, the evening newscast. And my guess is that we'll begin to move toward 10 o'clock, Monday through Friday, news and information kind of programming. You're seeing that in the courting of Diane Sawyer. That was the idea when we tried to get her at, 
at NBC, we're going to pursue hotly that concept at our network. I know that ABC is looking at it as well. So there's going to be more news and information on the air, and there will be serious news and information on the air as well. There is now, frankly, in these evening newscasts. And yet you have to compete with someone throwing $600,000 at yeah, that's Tanya Harding. I mean, that, that's a problem because yeah. I don't know. Can you compete with that? Well, sort I think of you can, and I, you know, and I think that I, I liken all of this to a, a nine-car pileup in the same intersection. We're all arriving in the same intersection at the same time. It really is because that's what it looks like. And, it, and then it's kind of bloody at the end. Uh, and the person who will avoid getting hurt in that and probably succeed and continue on their journey will be the one who will see the nine cars piling and say, there's another way around all of this. Let me look at a way and that the audience will respond to that. A classic example is in the New Yorker recent edition. Everybody did the polyclass story. The New Yorker went and took a look at the man who committed that crime. and How did he stay as free as he did for a long, long time? You know, that was doing the obvious. And we've got to start looking at those. It doesn't mean that people are going to not pay attention to Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding and Michael Jackson and the Menendez brothers, the class of 94, as I describe it. I think that we've had a terrible run. I hope we get past that for a while. Well, we, we're going to come to the part that we call the Barbara Walters uh, segment of us. And That's we're going to just... Yeah. <laughs> a standard on the Jerry and Judy show. Just rip her off. You know? What's your favorite color? No, no, no. no. What, we, what we really want to know is we're going to name some people, and uh, why don't you just tell us uh, a quick one-liner on what you think, what you feel. Not as Tom broke out the, the journalist as much as... Uh, let your guard down, Tom. Let your guard down. yourself just, here. Right. Just, just bury yourself right in front of us. Right. Right. Just, just spit it out. Uh, Bill Clinton. Um canny politician, uh, needs to be better organized and better focused about where he wants to go and share that with the country. Rush Limbaugh. Um, always a place for somebody like Rush Limbaugh uh, to kind of light the fires on the right. Uh, I don't think that he is as serious as somebody like Bill Sapphire, in fact, in, in, in taking a look at the conservative point of view. He's, he's this year's hot item. Yeah, I, and uh, there's a place for him. You know, I'm Louis Farrakhan. Um, Complex guy with a growing following in the African American community in America, and that has to be examined now. And I think that we have to work harder at knowing what he is all about because you cannot deny his constituency. Mario Cuomo. Um, one of the most gifted and enigmatic politicians I think I've known in my 31 years in this business, and why he didn't run as a big job is a question that will follow him probably to the end of his days. You think he would have won it? You know, Jerry, that's impossible to say. Yeah. This, the presidential races, as we have learned again and again and again, bring out the best and worst not only in people but in their lives and the people around them. And that what we don't know about Mario Cuomo is what we don't know. Um, you know, I guess people have asked you this before. Have you ever thought about running for political office? Well, people have asked me that before, but I want, I think it's an honorable profession. Uh, there was a time in my life when I was very young when I thought I probably would end up in politics, but I want more of a private life, not more of a public life. There are lots of demands when you're in the public arena, but I do believe that it's, it's important to have conditions where people can run. We are going to talk more about your personal life in another minute. Not too, not too hard. But I have to ask you, somebody in the street wants to know about those bracelets. Before we do It's my midlife affectation, I call this. I, this bracelet actually came from Africa, where I, it's really one of the, my favorite places to go. And this one, I got stuck in Nepal in a tiny little village because the weather closed in on us after a long trek. And I was doing a rug deal just to pass the time. It took most of the afternoon. And it finally came down. I said, if you throw in the bracelet, I'll take the rug. So I always remember pleasantly this bartering that went on all afternoon. That's it. That. I buy restaurants, he buys bracelets. Everyone takes <laughs> midlife in a different way. Who's going to go broke first? I want to know. We'll be back in a moment. Tom Brokaw. A man stuck between two and seven. Why do I think of milk products? I don't know. Wonder Bread, uh, Rice Pudding comes to mind. Tom Brokaw. You know why the NBC didn't cover the Olympics? Because uh, Tom Brokaw couldn't say Lilyhammer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got to ask you this. You know, if, if there is a rub against it, everybody we interview loves you, thinks you're a great interview. Mr. Perfect, here we go again. 
but they, they, the need to make fun of the elves, yeah. you know, and, and happens it mostly when I'm tired, and it's a, it's, you know, it's been an affliction that's been there for a long time, and if I don't pay attention to it, it sounds worse than it, than it is, and it's mostly, it's a kind of a lazy sleep habit as much as anything. Yeah. But, but it doesn't ever hurt your feelings, does it? Oh, when they do it, no, no. I mean, it's there, I'm, I'm aware of it, and I even get angry at myself from time to time. God made Imus a perfect person, and he had to do something. <laughs> <laughs> Lord knows. Right. You know, I, I've got to ask you, our kids are little. Your kids are grown. They seem to be doing pretty well. What's the biggest mistake you made as a parent? Um, I suppose that the mistake that you look back on always is that you didn't ask more of them, and you didn't ask them to ask more of you, I suppose. Uh, we do have wonderful children, and I give them most of the credit, but we were always there for them. I wished we had been there, not just physically more for them, but intellectually more for them, because they, they've got so much potential. And I think that's the thing to do, that you want to constantly challenge your kids without uh, driving them too hard, because they have so much capacity, and you, what you must do is encourage them to live up to their capacity. At every stage. So push them a little, because that was the follow-up question, is what's the yeah, you want Yeah, you want to make sure that they're doing the best that they can, and there are times in their lives when they need to be reminded of that. And, you know, we, we set parameters for them, but uh, I wish sometimes that we'd you know, hit their switches a little harder. But they've, they've turned out wonderfully well. They went to very good schools. They've done well, and I have no complaints. We're going to have to go now only because they wouldn't give us a full hour to do this show. <laughs> Uh, the fact is that this is really an hour show. We just have a half hour to right. do it. Uh, but I would like to uh, say thank you. Thank and you, Tom. And do you have one last question you want to ask us? Yes. Uh, any question? What's the special at the food market this week? Special at the <laughs> food market is the honey chicken with soy. Uh, I know it all. I'm back there slicing <laughs> roast no, I've beef. I've seen you. You'll always be a counterman. You know, that's how I'll think of you. And I, I, let me give you full credit as well for doing this. It's very brave. This is the television version. Of divorce doubles, as we call it in Canada. <laughs> and with that, maybe we'll see you next right. week. Thank you, Tom Brokaw. Okay, my pleasure. <laughs>